Hey, just a reminder, your quiz is day after tomorrow, first 30 minutes of class. And I will have office hours tomorrow from 9 to 10, and again, the day after from 9 to 10. So the two separate Zoom links, the 9 to 10 on Wednesday is a regular office hour Zoom link. Tomorrow is a new one. So I sent the links, yes, I think two days ago. I'll send them again, just in case you lost them. It'll cover just capital structure, the sections we finished last week. So what I'm going to do today is not going to be on the quiz, but it will be on the final. So at one level, you can relax. The other level, you can don't ignore it because clearly it is going to matter eventually. So let's see where we are. We've looked at the investment principle. We've looked at the financing principle. Now I want to turn to the third and final principle in corporate finance, which is the dividend principle. Now, before I do that, though, I want to put something on the table that I think we forget often when we talk about companies. I hear people talking about companies have cash. They have 3 billion in cash. Apple has 200 billion in cash. Google has 120 billion in cash. And I want to put something on the table that I think might change the way we think about cash and what companies should do with the cash. Companies don't have cash. Companies hold their shareholders' cash for them. That doesn't mean you as a shareholder can go out and claim that cash right away, but it is your cash. And that's why when a company uses cash to fund an acquisition, guess what cost we attach to that cash? If it's shareholders cash, we attach a cost of equity. So I've heard companies actually say this, it's our cash, it's free. You see how dangerous that view is? If you view cash as your cash, company cash, and you view it as free, a project that makes 3% looks like a good project. Why? Because it's free. So let's put that on the table because that's going to kind of clarify the discussion that's going to come. So here's what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on We're going to focus on the third and final principle. And there are two basic questions I want to try to answer. First is, you're a business. How much cash can you afford to return to your owners? Notice how I frame that. If you're a private business, how much cash can you take it out of the business? If it's a publicly traded company, how much cash can you return to your shareholders? So that we're going to look at what drives that. The second is, what form should that cash return take? 40 years ago, that discussion would have been moot. What's the only way companies return cash to the early 1980s? You pay dividends or nothing. I'm going to show you what's happened over the last 40 years, not just in the US, but around the world. And we can talk about why it's happened because for some people, it's scary. Many value investors think of this as the worst possible thing that's ever happened, this move from dividends to buybacks. Many politicians think that it's at the root of every evil that you see in the economy. So we're going to kind of put some facts about buybacks because there's a lot of misconceptions floating around about buybacks. So to get the process started, let's think about how, in a rational world, we would set dividends. You run a business, what are dividends? It's a cash you can take out of the business, right? In a sense, if you define it that way, it should be the last step in the process, not the first step. So if you're a business and I say, how much cash are you going to take out? The first thing you're going to do is you're going to see, you know, if you borrowed money, how much, so you're going to start with the operations. How much cash do I get from operations? Then if you're borrowing money, you're going to bring that in. And then once you get the cash flows to equity, you decide how much to reinvest back in the business. And whatever's left over is what you take out of the business. In other words, Dividend should be a residual cash flow. It's what's left over at the end of the year, or the way I'd like to describe it, it's a cash left in the till at the end of the year that you take out of the business. That is what you would do in a rational world. But in my view, there is no aspect of corporate finance that's more dysfunctional than dividends. Because you know how many companies think about dividends? They decide how much to pay in dividends first, and then that drives how much they borrow and which projects they take. It's not the way it's supposed to be, but it turns out to be that way. So there are two things you're going to notice when I talk about dividend policy. 
The first is you're going to notice a lot of inertia. What does that mean? When you ask companies, why do you pay the dividends that you do? Or some com companies don't pay dividends. The answer is because we've never done anything different because this is what we've always done. The second is a lot of me tooism. If you ask a bank, why do you pay dividends? The answer is because all other banks pay dividends. If you ask a tech company, why don't you pay dividends? It's because no other companies pay dividends. Inertia and me tooism is in the background, every corporate finance decision, but in dividends in particular, you see it come front and center. So I'm gonna lay out some basic facts about dividends. So we're gonna talk about old fashioned dividends first, and then we'll bring in what's changed over the last 40 years. If there's one word I would use to describe dividends, at least in the US and perhaps much of Europe, I would, des I would describe them as sticky. What does that mean? In most years, when you look at what companies pay out in dividends, they pay out what they did last year. Let me back this up. For the last 30 plus years, I've been keeping track of US companies that increase dividends, decrease dividends, and do nothing to dividends. So the green line is increases in dividends. The red column is decreases in dividends and the purple slash whatever color that is, is no change in dividends. Notice that in every single year, the companies that don't change dividends dominate companies that do change dividends. So that's the first fact. In most years, if you look at companies, they pay out what they did last year in dividends. And among the companies that change dividends, increases in dividends, outnumber decreases in dividends, six to one, eight to one, 10 to one. Now, part of you saying, what if it's a bad year? Let's take two really bad years for the market, 2008 and 2020. In 2008, were there more dividend decreases than, than usual? Yes. But even in 2008, dividend increases outnumbered dividend decreases. Remember 2020, the entire global economy got shut down? 2020, there, was still, there were more decreases in dividends, but again, increases in dividends outnumbered decreases in dividends. So if you were to characterize dividend policy in most companies, what the company pays out in dividends is similar or equal to what it did last year. And if it changes dividends, it's more likely to increase dividends than decrease. Dividends are sticky. Any questions on the stickiness of dividends? Yes. What is the y axis show? The y-axis is showing the percentage of all companies. So the, if you add up the three, it should be 100%, right? So if you look at the 36% increase of the companies, the reason is the number of companies change on a year, ba year to year basis. So I wanted to keep it comparable. So I looked at the percentage of companies increasing dividends the percentage decreasing and the percentage not changing dividends. Each other. The performance of the stock. No, 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 it's got nothing to do with stock returns. It's just the percent. So if you have a hundred, okay. if you have if you have a hundred companies, thirty-five increased dividends, fifteen decreased dividends, and fifty did nothing. I'm just looking at the percentage of companies increasing, decreasing, or doing nothing to dividends. So let's say 2020. I took a closer look at 2020 because. It's in a sense a lab experiment, right? How bad do things have to be before companies cut dividends? They were in 2020, 287 companies increased dividends. I mean, think about it. 2020, everybody was freaking out. COVID was shutting things down. 287 companies increased dividends. Levin, I'm sorry, and Levin actually initiated dividends for the first time. 27 decreased dividends and 42 suspended dividends. That 42 dividend suspensions is the highest number we've seen in 20 years. So it is true companies cut dividends in 2020, but increases in dividends still outnumber decreases in dividends. Of the 42 dividend sus uh, suspensions, the number that increased dividends still vastly exceeded the number that cut dividends. What I'm trying to say is even in really bad years, you see companies still continuing to pay dividends and increase dividends. And even a good year, it gets even worse in terms of that disconnect. So dividends are sticky. Here's the second word I'd use to describe dividends. They tend to follow earnings. Keyword is follow earnings. What does that mean? Let's say you have a company that has a really good earnings year. 
It's a dividend paying company. Don't expect it to increase dividends right away. If it has two good years in a row, maybe it'll increase dividends next year. Three, three good years in a row, then you might see an increase in dividends. Same thing with decreases in dividends. You have a bad year, don't expect to see a cut in dividends right away. Companies seem to wait before they adjust dividends. So if you look at this graph, it's actually both dividends, earnings and dividends in the column. And then that black line is the payout ratio over time. Notice what's happening to the percentage of earnings that's getting paid out as dividends. If you fit a trend line, you're clearly a lower percentage of earnings is being paid out in dividends. It's just part of the story, but less of the earnings is being paid out in dividends now than 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Now do you see why this freaks out value investors? If you're an old time value investor, what were you taught to review? Yeah, yeah. Dividends, mm -hmm. right? Ben Graham dividend discount model. That dividend, as a, if you look at collectively across companies, is becoming a smaller percentage of earnings. So dividends are sticky, dividends tend to follow earnings. And they are affected by tax laws, not corporate tax laws, but individual investor tax laws. And think of why. You're a stockholder in a company. How does it work when the company pays a dividend? You have to report it as ordinary income that year and get taxed on those dividends. What's the other way you make money as an equity investor in a company? Price appreciation, right? When do you get taxed on price appreciation? At least historically in the US though, this might change. You get taxed only when you sell the shares. Already you can see that there are two different, in fact, historically dividends were treated as ordinary income capital gains were treated as capital gains. So basically, and for almost eight decades in the US, the two were taxed at different rates. So if you look at, uh, at dividends in US companies, you see that dividends and capital gains are taxed at different rates. That can affect what companies pay out in dividends. What I've looked at in this graph are a couple of changes in that tax code that affect a dividend policy. I told you for almost eight decades, dividends were taxed as ordinary income. Capital gains were taxed at a lower rate. So I think I'll give you the peak numbers. In 1981, ordinary income in the US was taxed at 70% for the highest income individuals. So if you receive dividends, you paid 70% of the dividends as taxes. Capital gains were taxed at 28%. In fact, capital gains was set at 40% of the ordinary tax rate for much of the last, of between I think 1970 and 2003. So if you are an investor, you'd rather receive capital gains, at least from a tax perspective than dividends. What happened in 2003? It was a tax reform act. And in this tax reform act for the first time in a long time, dividends and capital gains were taxed at the same rate. 20% was the tax rate on board. That was a big change. It basically meant that now you no longer had the tax disadvantage associated with dividends. Well, did that change dividend policy? Very mildly. You can see how difficult it is to get dividends to change. So in the 2003 tax law came about, people thought, oh, companies are gonna pay a lot more in dividends now that the disadvantage is gone. They did pay a little more in dividends, but not by a huge amount. That 2003 tax reform, though, came with a 10-year sunset. Don't ask me why people write corporate tax code this way. I know the political reasons. You know why they had to have a 10-year sunset? You heard of the filibuster from the Senate, right? You need to get to 60 votes. And the 2003 Tax Reform Act did not have 60 votes. And if you don't have 60 votes, you've got to use what's called the Bird Rule, which means you've got to show that this tax code change is not going to have long-term budget implications. So the way they wrote it was, we're gonna write this law at the end of 10 years, guess what happens? It's almost like the law was never written. We're gonna revert back to 2002 laws. Terrible way to write tax law, but they wrote it. They assumed that somewhere between 2003 and 2012, Congress would do the sensible thing, which is come up with a long-term tax cord to fix this. But if you ever observe the US Congress, good sense is not exactly on top of their priorities. So guess what they did? They kept putting it off and putting it off till the last quarter of 2012. 
You're facing a cliff here. Because remember what happens on December 31st of 2012, the tax code is revert, going to revert back to what it was in 2002, which means dividends are going to go back to being taxed at 50% or 45%. So in the last quarter of 2012, guess what companies started to do? Because they were worried that dividends would now get taxed at a higher rate. You saw a surge in dividend payments just in that last quarter. There was, a, in fact, special dividends that were paid out by a lot of companies primarily to get dividends paid. You probably know how the story ended. On December 28th of 2012, three days before the cliff, Congress came with some patchwork fix, putting it off for another 10 years. We run into this over and over again with the tax code. As I said, it's a terrible way to write tax code, but it's almost built into the system. Now, those two things that I talked about, dividends stick, being sticky and dividends affected by the tax code, I've talked primarily about US companies. Let's expand the discussion. Though. Dividends are sticky everywhere in the world. But in Latin America, it's not absolute dividends that are sticky, it's dividend payout ratios. Because of the way Latin American companies raise money, they raise it from voting and non-voting shares, they're often required to pay out 35% or 40% or 45% of their earnings in dividends. That ratio is sticky. You know what that means, all right? The actual dividends at Latin American companies tend to be much more volatile because they're targeting a payout ratio. That's not true for all Latin American companies, but that tends to be the big, big the part of the world where you see the biggest differences on stickiness. On the tax code, the US has historically, at least until 2003, had this tilt against dividends. But there are two countries where there's a tilt towards dividends. The UK and Australia allow individual investors when they receive dividends to get a credit for the taxes companies have paid on the income from which the dividends are paid. In other words, if you have a 25% tax rate, and the company paid a 30% tax rate on its income before it came up with after-tax income, you're allowed to claim that credit, which means dividends become almost tax exempt. So in the UK and Australia, the, the tax tilt is against capital gains because of the way it's structured. So guess what? Australian companies and British companies are still among the biggest dividend payers in the world, partly driven by differences in tax code. So if you're interested, one of the things you might want to look at is how, how, is, how are dividends and capital gains taxed in different parts of the world? Because that kind of explains why you often get big differences in dividend policy around the world. So dividends are sticky. Dividends follow earnings. Dividends are affected by the tax code. But let me talk about what I think is the biggest sea change in dividend policy. When I took my corporate finance class in 1979, the only way to return cash was dividends. If you had a buyback, it was very unusual. Companies did not buy back stock. But somewhere in the 1980s, you started to see the shift where companies started returning more and more cash in the form of stock buybacks. So in this graph, basically, the Red line, you can see it's starting to pick up. In fact, if I went all the way, by, way back to 81, buybacks are almost non-existent, so you don't even see it. So it starts to pick up in the 80s, and then it kicks in in the 90s. And then by the time you get to, I think, 1998, for the first time in history, more cash was collectively returned by US companies in buybacks than in dividends. And that trend has continued. In fact, in 2021, if you look at the percentage of cash returned in the form of buybacks, it was almost 60%. This year, it's expected to be close to 65%. So we've gone from almost none of the cash returned in the form of buybacks to two thirds of the cash at US companies now being returned in the form of buybacks. So I'm gonna throw open a gentle question. What's changed between 1981 and now that explains the shift away from traditional dividends? Because that's basically what's happening. Companies, instead of paying out cash and dividends, are increasingly buying back stock. 
What do you think has changed between the 1980s and now that explains that? Yes. Well, this is 1981. 1981, you actually had 8% rates. 1990s, you had 6% rates. This isn't just in the last decade. So if your argument is right, then I should see an increase in debt ratios across companies over the last decade, and we don't. So it's not being funded with debt. So let's get that myth out of the way. There is a mythology floating around that the way companies are buying back stock is by borrowing huge amounts. That is just not true. You can't, and I see critics do this all the time. Companies are borrowing money and paying out dividends. You can't make up crap. There are some companies that might do it, but collectively, this cannot be explained by companies borrowing money and buying back stock. And the global competition, because if you're buying back stock, you're saying you're good prospects. You've returned either way, you're sending, sending the same signal, right? Why is but if you're buying back stock or paying dividends, what are you saying about your growth prospects? Either way, you're saying, I don't have investments. So there's no signaling difference between the two. In fact, you could argue, and we'll talk about this later, that dividends are stronger signals about growth prospects and buybacks in many ways. Yeah. How big has to do with the change in the shareholder base of okay. the US company? Okay, let's go, let's go there. So what? So give me some, some detail. What do you think has changed that leads to this push towards? So during the mid-1900s, like mid we had like a lot of individual investors in companies. But that has shifted towards more institutional, institutional large individual investors that actually hold big okay. stakes in the company. I agree. So if that's a fact. Institutional investment percentage has gone up. But if you look at institutional investors, that are very motley crew, right? You've got pension funds that actually like dividends. You've got mutual funds, some of which are dividend-based. And then you have might have hedge funds that might. So it's not clear to me that having a, a higher percent of institutional investors by itself, because in the UK and Australia, the same thing has happened and there you don't see as much of a shift towards buybacks. So I, I think there's a partial story. The investor composition has changed. Maybe the people who invest money in markets tend to be wealthier. So I'll fill in the detail. It doesn't have to be institutional. If you're wealthier, you're not as dependent on dividends so guess what? You want to push towards price appreciation. So it might reflect that composition. There's, in, in the, there's an income inequality, wealth inequality. The, the type of people invest in stock markets are essentially people who want capital gains. So maybe that could explain why you go to buybacks as opposed to dividends. Okay. Yes? What about because dividends are sticky once you start paying it? Okay. it but they've all, it. That, you're onto something, but that's always been true, right? It's true in the 1950s, it was true in the 1920s, it was true in the 1970s. So take that to the next step. When do you worry about dividends being sticky as a company? When you're in a downturn or the economy. Or when you're uncertain about the future, right? So let me ask you, and this is my follow-up. Has something changed about the uncertainty companies face over the last 40 years that makes them much less willing to continue paying dividends? So I'm going to let you... Because you so that's the first thing, right? 40 years ago, many companies had local markets where they dominated the market. They didn't have to worry about it. And not just in the US, across the world. Now, 40 years ago, if you asked me to list 200 companies in the US with nice, stable, predictable earnings, I'd have had no trouble. There were entire sectors that were protected. What have we done in the last 40 years? First is globalization, then increases competition. How about disruption? What is disruption to? Take businesses that used to be nice, stable, predictable businesses and upend, upended the game. The world has become a more uncertain place for businesses. And when you're uncertain about the future, sticky dividends are the last thing you want to do, right? I mean, take Apple. Can it afford to pay dividends? Yes. Can it afford to, let me take that back. Let, can it afford to return cash? Yes. Does it want to increase dividends to $50 per share? I don't think so. Because it's in the technology business. Smartphones sell great now. Their iPhones are selling well now, but what if they don't three years from now? So I think what companies face now is uncertainty about the future. And dividends, I think, are a throwback to the past. Dividends have never made sense as a way of returning cash to equity investors. Think of why. 
Equity is a residual claim, right? If you think of it as a residual claim, how the heck can it be the same number every year? It's never made sense. So let's go back 150 years and think about what it is that created this dysfunction called dividends. You know, bond markets preceded equity markets. So when stock markets first started, bonds were already out there and investors bought bonds for coupons. So when stock markets started, they wanted to get money invested in stocks. Guess how they marketed themselves? They said, well, just like bonds, look, we pay a dividend and the dividend is stable. It was designed to attract people into equity markets. That was 150 years ago, and we've never let go. So when people talk about, they wish they could go back to the old days. The old days, you might have a stable, predictable income. You could get away with these sticky dividends. But if you're uncertain about the future, it's a very dangerous path to go down. In fact, I'll give you an analogy that might help you explain the shift away from dividends to buybacks. My daughter is now 26 years old. When she was seven or eight, I had to take her to a birthday party. So she gets in the back seat. She was still tiny. She had to be in a car seat, even though at that age, you know, because it's based on weight. So she straps herself in, demands that I turn the radio station to Z100. I turn it on. I think they play the same song over and over and over again all day long. You know? And then between the songs, of course, the DJs come on, they start to talk to each other. And they start to talk to each other about hooking up. And to show you how disconnected you get after three decades of getting married, I'm saying, what the heck is hooking up? And my eight-year-old pipes up from the back seat trying to explain to me what hooking up is. Now, part of me is in shock that my eight-year-old is talking about these things. The other part of me is thinking, this is a great way to think about why companies buy back stock instead of paying dividends. You know what? Paying dividends is like getting married, right? In good times and in bad times for the rest of your life. It's very sticky. Buybacks are like hooking up. Here's five billion. Never see you again. Not a problem. We'll both move on. You know what? Companies increasingly are hooking up with investors. And investors increase it. In the old days, you used to actually buy stock and hold on to it for 35 years. Who does that anymore? Unless you're 75 years old. It's one way to think about why the shift towards buybacks is not going to go away. You can hold your nose and I'll just wish it away. It's not going away. And it's going global. In case you think this is just in the US, think again. At the start of this year, for instance, I update numbers. Look at the percentage of cash in buybacks in different parts of the world. You know what? There's not a single part of the world where it's 0%. The lowest is in Africa, in the Middle East, and China. But if you look across the world, you can see that this is a phenomenon that's picking up around the world. And I think the as the uncertainty increases, you are going to see buybacks continue to pick up. Yes. The risk of a company not meeting the investors' expectations, they say the investors expect a sticky dividend and they don't. The risk is they, they get attacked or the stock price gets up. <clears throat> so we look at what happens when companies cut dividends. It's it's you know, it you might recover from it, but in the process, the management will often lose its jobs. There's a lot of blood on the floor when you cut dividends. No company likes to cut dividends. No. That's part of what makes for the stickiness is they don't increase dividends till they feel they can sustain them. And what's happened over the last 40 years is fewer and fewer companies get to that point of saying, I feel comfortable increasing dividends. So guess what they do? They shift to buybacks. On top of that, you also have this shift in company composition, right? More companies today are technology companies and riskier businesses, more uncertain futures. Sticky dividends don't work for them. So dividends are sticky. Dividends follow earnings. Dividends are affected by tax laws. Increasingly, whenever we talk about dividends, we also have to talk about stock buybacks. <clears throat> 
But let me go back to dividends because when you look at how investors, analysts, companies measure how much they pay in dividends, there are two widely used measures of how much companies pay in dividends. The first is the dividend payout ratio. What's the dividend payout ratio? It's dividends divided by net income. It's as simple as that. So if you have net income of 200, you pay 50 in dividends, your payout ratio is 25%. In fact, the flip side of the payout ratio is called the retention ratio. Whatever doesn't get paid out is retained. What does it measure? It measures how much a company pays out and by extension, it measures what it's being reinvested. The second widely used measure of dividends is called the dividend yield. The dividend yield is the dividend pay, expected dividend paid or the dividend paid divided by the, the, market, the, the market price of the stock. So if you have a $50 stock that pays a $2 dividend, you got a 4% dividend yield. You're saying, what does that tell me? Remember when we used the CAPM to come up with the cost of equity, we plugged the beta and we came up with the cost of equity for Disney of 9.95%. It's a lifetime ago. That's what you can expect to earn as a stockholder. But remember, you earn it from two places. You earn part of it from dividends, and the dividend yield tells you what percentage. And whatever is not dividend yield then becomes expected price appreciation. So it allows you to break down the cost of equity, how much from dividends, how much from price appreciation. Now, I, I think repeatedly talked about perspective in corporate finance, which is when you look at a number, how do you know whether the number is high or low? So when I tell you the return on invested capital at my company is 20%, you say, well, is that a good number? Is that a bad number? Is that a typical number? The same thing applies with payout ratios and dividend yields. If you told me that your company has a payout ratio of 37%, then you probably are also curious, is that a high number? Is that a typical number? So to give you some perspective, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to look at dividend payout ratios globally among dividend paying companies. And I'll explain why I added that qualifier. So I took all dividend paying companies, broke their dividend payout ratios from 0% all the way up. So if you ask me what the median dividend payout ratios for a company, it's probably around 30, 35%. Among dividend paying companies, the median payout ratio is about 35%. But there's some interesting quirks in this that, that, that might be worth examining. Notice that there's a fairly large percentage of companies that pay out more than 100% of their earnings as dividends. Let me explain how I got the payout ratio. I took the earnings in the most recent 12 months and the dividends in the most recent 12 months, divided by the dividends by the earnings. So I want you to talk to tell me something about the companies that pay out more than 100% because at first sight, that looks irrational, right? You're paying out more than your earnings as dividends. And some of these companies might be irrational, but I think there's some good reasons why you see payout ratios greater than 100%. So can you give me some ideas of what, what companies might be in that mix? One is declining companies, right? We talked about companies starting to shrink. So if you're JC Penny and you're actually making money, it doesn't make sense for you to reinvest. You want to get smaller over time. So one is in the life cycle, companies decline. Any companies that for some accounting reasons or down, or, so yeah, actually... It doesn't even have to be accounting, right? If you're an oil company, oil prices drop, your earnings drop, but what do you do? You continue to pay dividends expecting the cycle to come back. So in fact, commodity companies, if you look at their history, during low price in the commodity cycle, will often pay out more than 100% of their earnings as dividends, but they will make up for it in the good times by paying 30% of their earnings is dividends. So the second is, you just had a bad year. I'm looking at one year. It could be accounting reasons. It could be a, a loss that's a one-time loss. It could be a price cycle. So when you see payout, those great Don't jump down the throats of the company and say, you're doing a terrible thing. Take a look at the earnings. If it's in fact a bad year, you should see that because the most recent year will be much lower. If it's a decline company that's trying to shrink, you should see it in other clues, right? The return on capital is less than the cost of capital. Revenues are shrinking, margins are getting lower. So dividend payout ratios can sometimes be higher than 100%. So when you do this for your company, if you get 220 20%, don't freak out. It's not the end of the world. It can happen. And you have lots of companies. Oh, the other thing is we look at differences in payout ratios around the world. You know, African Middle Eastern companies have among the highest so if you look at the highest payout ratios, 
Australia and New Zealand, and we talked about why, right? Why do Australian companies pay out so much in earnings? First, they're commodity companies. They tend to be pretty mature businesses. That's a big chunk of the market. The other is the tax court, driving high dividend payouts in these countries because you actually get a tax benefit as an investor. You're saying, but doesn't that mean they're not taking projects? Not necessarily. What's the other number you need to look at to make that judgment? Can you pay out more than you can afford to? and still continue to grow the way you did? Yes, by either raising fresh equity. So if you make, in fact, you'd be surprised how many companies pay out dividends through one window and raise fresh equity through another. Because that allows them to keep investors happy and meet their investment needs. The lowest payout ratios in the world, you know, some you can explain high growth countries like India, you, you tend, but if you look at the contrast, you can see actually that it's more than just fundamentals. It reflects a history in these markets. Yeah. If you take on less debt and you pay out more than your, you can afford to because the tax code encourages dividends, then something's got to fill the gap, right? Either you invest less and you're growing slower as companies or you're raising fresh equity. Remember, this is a pie. If I take some of the pie and give it out, I've got to make up for it. So I don't think you can make the debt argument from the dividend argument because it depends on what companies do to fill the gap. If they fill the gap by borrowing money, the debt ratios of these companies are actually going to be higher than in the rest of the world. Okay. And if you want, you can go back and look at the comparison I did of debt ratios when we did capital structure across regions of the world to see if there's a story that connects. Let's talk about dividend yields. Again, dividend yield is dividends paid divided by the stock price. The median dividend yield for a US company now is about one and a half to 2%. You know what the median number used to be 30 years ago? Closer to three and a half to 4%. Now, part of it is because I'm not counting buybacks, but even if I do count buybacks, I would expect the cash yield. So let's call that collective yield to be lower now than it was 40 years ago, why? Yes. Earnings have gone up, but it hasn't had, like the change hasn't affected. But, how, why aren't invest, but why aren't investors complaining? Because the collective yield is lower. The shift of capital gains, like they're, they're counting on the capital gains for the shares. Yeah, that's kind of a greed argument, right? But I would say there's a much, what's your alternative if you don't invest in stocks? Bonds and interest rates are up. There you go. Right. If T-bond rates are 7%, to compete for your money, I need to offer you a much higher cash yield, right? Because otherwise you're not going to buy stocks. If T-bond rates go to 1.5%, guess what? I can give you a 1% dividend yield and you're going to go. It's a celebration because you've got almost to the risk-free rate with just the dividend yield. I'll wager if I put the risk-free rate over time and the dividend yields over time, you're going to see this connection come up. The simplest reason explaining why cash yields now are lower than they were 30 years ago is interest rates have become much lower. The two are connected. And in fact, there's a, there's a group of companies out there that look, I have a book called Investment Fables. I've not updated in 20 years. I should, you know, I'm working on a revision this year. It's about stories that people tell you about sure things in investing. And here's a story that you can buy a stock that actually delivers higher returns in buying a, a safe bond and get price appreciation. Sounds like a really good thing, right? You see how this leads you to high dividend yield stocks? If I'm your advisor, a very bad advisor, but you're an investor who comes to me for advice, I ask you to load up on those stocks that pay dividend yields of more than 5%. Seems like an amazing return because I make 5% in dividend yields, that's well above what I can make on bonds, even safe bonds, you know, forget about treasury bonds, even safe corporate bonds. I'm probably making more than a triple B grade bond would deliver. And on top of that, what do you get? You're getting stock, so you should get price appreciation. So what's wrong? What am I missing when I tell people to go? I mean, in fact, there are, there are, there are these investment strategies. Have you heard of the Dow dogs? 
basically what it does, it takes the Dow 30 and it takes the four or five stocks of the highest dividend yields and puts all your money in them. And there's some history that this is delivered returns. But tell me what the problem is of an investment strategy that's loaded up with high dividend yield stocks, especially stocks with dividend yields of five, six, seven percent, well above the risk rate. Isn't it like implicitly like those are low, low stocks actually like there's not going to be that capital? First, let's step back. When you buy a bond, there's a contractual payment due to you, right? When you buy stocks, even though the dividend yield is high right now, there is no contractual claim. So next year, the company eliminates dividends. You can't sue them saying, I thought you were going to pay a 5% dividend yield for the rest of eternity. It doesn't work. So first, let's be very clear. A coupon is a contractual claim. Dividends are a promise claim. So if you get them and you, you know, that's great. So when you look at stocks with six, seven, 8% dividend yields in this market right now. You know what you're going to get? A bunch of basket case companies. Why? Because the market reflects what's happened to the company, but the dividends reflect what the company paid last year. And if things have changed significantly at the company, it might not be able to. In fact, I can almost guarantee you that those dividend yield stocks, if you buy them, terrible things are going to happen to companies in your portfolio over the next two or three years. You're going to complain about it but I'm gonna say you should have seen that coming given the dividend yield. So if you don't believe me, go to S&P Capital IQ, screen for stocks with dividend yields more than 10%. There are actually companies that will come through, US companies with dividend yields. Don't do anything crazy like buying all those companies. Take a look at each of those companies and very quickly you're going to see why that dividend yield could be a mirage. So payout ratios, dividend yields, Let's, give, let's start with a very simple way of thinking about you know, what companies can choose from. Uh, quick question, why, how come certain industries like utilities and like oil and gas, why are they not getting the growth? We'll talk about that because we're gonna talk about the drivers of dividends and very quickly when we start to look at the fundamentals that determine how much cash. In fact, we'll start with this. This chart alone will explain why you see companies in some sectors return more cash than us. It's a life cycle view of the world. Remember we used the life cycle to explain what companies should borrow. We said young companies shouldn't borrow money. As you mature as a company, you can afford to borrow money and decline. You can maintain that debt ratio. If you think about dividends, the same life cycle comes into play. If you're a young startup, how much should you pay in dividends? What's wrong with you? Why are you even thinking about dividends? You're a young growth company of negative cash flows. And as you're growing and you have these huge investment needs, guess what? You should continue not to return cash. It's not just dividends. You shouldn't be returning cash. As your earnings growth starts to slow down, your capacity to pay dividends will open up. And initially, what are you going to do? You're going to fight growing old. You're going to insist that you're going to be young again. So each year you do this, guess what's happening to your cash balance? It's going to build up and up and up because you're really not a growth company. You're a middle-aged company acting like you're a growth company. It takes a while before companies come to this recognition. It took Intel 10 years after they slowed down and became a mature company before they initiated dividends. Apple could have started paying dividends in 2006 or seven. It took them five years and Carl Icahn putting pressure on them before they started paying dividends and buying back stock. I don't blame them because I can understand why companies try to put off that, that getting old face, but you can see cash build up. Mature companies should be able to return a higher percentage of their cash as dividends. So I'll give you a partial answer. You look at the sectors you name, oil and gas, utilities. Where would you put them collectively on this life cycle? Where do you put oil and gas? Clearly not growth. Not even probably mature. Oil and gas is probably in decline with climate change and the push and pull. Declining companies, I would expect to see a lot of cash return. Utilities, the nature of utilities in the US is you're regulated. You can't go into other businesses, which means that your earnings are predictable. You don't have much reinvestment needs. You build up. I mean, if you're a part of your con ed, it's not like you're building new plants every year. The population is pretty stable. It's different in the mountain states. Maybe they, those companies pay less in dividends. So the, sec the, comp the sectors you listed tend to be 
mature low growth sectors. They should be returning a lot of cash to their shareholders. I still haven't answered the question, why did they take the form of dividends? We'll, come, we'll, we'll finish that loop when we get to what drives why some companies pay more dividends, but you can see why cash payout varies across sectors. And there's some backing for this. Uh, you know, I actually classified, and this is just US companies where I was able to get expected growth in earnings for each company from analysts. So very simplistically, I broke down the expected growth rate and earnings of companies into six groups. So you can see expected growth rate zero to 3%, so from low growth to high growth. And then I looked at the payout ratios and dividend yields of companies in each group. And I got a predictable result. Low growth companies tend to have much higher payout ratios and much higher yields than high growth companies. And that's exactly what you'd expect to see from the life cycle. So already I want you to start thinking about your company, the company working in the project, say, is it a mature company? Is it a grow already? And that should give you some insight into what you should expect to see on its cash returns. That might not be what they actually do because sometimes companies do what they shouldn't, but it should give you at least some insight on what, what you should expect to see. Any questions in the life cycle and how it can explain? So let me, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, it's not very high. These are not just high dividends. They're high dividends relative to the stock price. That's what creates a problem. If you have high dividends and you have stock price is high. The market says, look, you know, you can afford to pay dividends. But when you see the disconnect there, what does the market price say? It says the market's pretty depressed about your future prospects. Your earnings are probably going to decline over time. But your dividends tell me that you're in denial. That's what makes for the lack of health. It's not just high dividends per se, but the fact that you have high dividends and low market cap. Of course, the market could be wrong. That's why, that's what value investors hope, right? They think the market's made a mistake to buy these stocks. But I'm saying when you get this much of a disconnect, it's not just the market being wrong. There's something fundamentally going on in this company that's got to be factored in. So let me lay out the dividend payout ratios and yields for my companies, companies I'm tracking, and I you have all five publicly traded companies. So with each one, I've looked at the yield and payout ratio for the last 12 months, as well as an average in the five years leading in. I'll tell you why I look at the last 12 months, because it gives me what the company did in the most recent year. You're saying, why you look at the last five years? For the reasons we talked about earlier, earnings can go up and down. So looking at last 12 months, for instance, you look at a company like Vale, it looks crazy, right? 113.45% payout ratio. But that was because iron ore prices in 2013 had dropped to lows. So if I took a fair view here, I'd say, look, I'm not gonna jump down your throat. If I look at the average payout ratio over the last five years, I'm getting a more reasonable number. But I would put a, a caveat here. So if Vale CFO is sitting across the table and he says, am I okay now? The average looks okay. The caveat is you're hoping that iron ore prices will go back up. That's what the average tells you. But you've locked yourself now to dividends where if iron ore prices stay low, you're going to be in trouble. And in 2013, I'll tell you what commodity companies around the world were facing. They'd come off a decade of plenty. You know what caused the decade of plenty? China. China's always the right answer to pretty much any question. Because between 2002 and 2012, China was building up infrastructure at a rate that we've never seen in history. What did that mean? You, they were using steel and iron ore in quantities that had never been used in short periods before. That pushed up commodity prices across the board between 2002 and 2012. A lot of commodity companies started paying earning dividends on the expectation that this would continue for a very long time. And then in 2011 and 12, China started to wind down. Why? Because when you get to be a large economy, you can't keep building up infrastructure at the same rate. So my warning to Vale would be, you built a dividend policy built on China you might want to bring your dividends down and not assume that things are going to revert back to the way they used to be. Yes? What if Vale cuts its dividend and proportionally increases buyback? Do they still pay 
it's still the same problem, right? You're returning more than your earnings. And if you have growth prospects then, so this is not just about getting investors happy. You still have needs in the company that you got to meet with either retained earnings or with new equity or with new debt. There are only three places you can go for capital, right? So when you pay, when you return more than 100% of your earnings as cash, your retained earnings side is not just gone, it's actually a negative. You now have to tell me you're going to borrow money or raise fresh equity. And if you looked at our capital structure analysis for Vale, do you remember what we concluded? They're already over levered. So the debt side is cut off. So where do you go for the fresh capital? And it seems almost insane to be buying back stock and issuing stock at the same time, right? So that's why you got to think about what's your plan for the future. And that's what should drive your cash return rather than ask what, should, what can I do to keep investors happy right now? So you can see the payout ratios. In fact, for Deutsche, the payout ratio was 362%. And in the case of Deutsche, the company was certifiably insane, going completely insane. So they could have used a five-year average, but the reality was Deutsche was going down a very dark hole, but it was continuing to pay dividends as if it was 2007. We talked about inertia. Companies often don't factor in fundamental changes that are happening in the business when it comes to dividend policy. So I'm going to set the table now. When you think about are dividends good, bad, or neutral? In other words, should a company increase dividends or decrease dividends? There is no question in corporate finance where there's more of a mixed signal that we send to companies than dividend policy. Let me explain. In investment analysis, when, I, when you ask me, should I take a good project based on corporate finance, what's my answer? If your net present value is positive, of course you should. In capital structure, if you ask me, should I borrow more debt? So if your cost of capital decreases when you borrow more debt, go ahead and borrow more debt. In the case of dividend policy, though, there are three schools of thought giving three very different messages. The first one says, if there are no tax disadvantages to investors between dividends and capital gains, they're neutral, on, they're taxed the same way. And you can go out and raise as much equity as you want with no issuance costs. It doesn't matter how much you pay in dividends. Sounds absurd, but if investors don't care about whether they get dividends or capital gains, and you can raise capital, it doesn't matter how much you pay in dividends. In other words, dividend policy is irrelevant. Your value as a company is going to be driven by your investing and financing. Dividends don't matter. Does that sound mildly familiar? When we did capital structure, didn't we say something else didn't matter? The Miller Modigliani said, in a world with no taxes, no default risk, no agency costs, it doesn't matter how much you borrow. This is Miller Modigliani too. And it says, in a world with no taxes, or investors are taxed in the same way, and capital markets are open, it doesn't matter how much you pay in dividends. If we lived in a Miller Modigliani world, we could have stopped this class after what, the 15th session, right after we did investment analysis, because the rest becomes irrelevant. So we're going to start with that examination because it sounds outrageous, but we'll talk about what, what, ba what, what the basis for it is and how some companies actually would get very close to the Miller Modigliani view of dividends. The second school of thought says dividends are bad. And this school of thought had its roots in how tax policy. Remember I said until 2003, dividends were taxed at a higher rate than capital gains. The second school of thought says, why would you ever want to pay dividends? Your investors pay 40, 50% tax rates and dividends, only 20% capital gains, stop paying dividends. In fact, there was a very strong movement in the 1980s and 90s in corporate finance say, companies should just stop paying dividends. It just doesn't make sense from a tax perspective. And there's a third school of thought. And it says, if your stockholders like dividends, for whatever reason, they prefer dividends, over getting price appreciation. Well, guess what? Like if the customer is always right in marketing, you should pay out more in dividends. Dividends are good, dividends are bad, or dividends don't matter. You see how convenient this is as a, for, if you're a CFO? No matter what you do, you've got an entire school of thought backing you up, right? You've got increased dividends. You pointed the dividends are a good school. You cut dividends, you pointed the dividends are bad school. You have no idea what you're doing on dividends. So I belong in the Milamotigliani school. It doesn't matter anyway. There is actually, there are actually seeds of truth in each school, and I'm going to try to bring them all 
into one, I think, more balanced perspective. So here's what I'm going to say. You tell me whether from a common sense perspective, this makes sense. If you're a company with a lot of cash coming in, you don't have very many investment opportunities, then you should find a way to return more cash to your shareholders. Let me repeat that again. You have a lot of cash coming in from operations. You don't have very many investment needs, then you should return more cash. Everybody agree with that? Conversely, if you're a company that doesn't have much cash coming in, you have lots of investment opportunities, then you shouldn't be returning cash. I'm going to try to put this into practice later, but that's the common sense perspective I'm going to arrive at. But I'm going to examine the three schools of thought and where they come from. Let's start with the Miller Gliani view that dividends don't matter. That sounds like an absurd thing to say, right? So let's play a game. Let's suppose I'm a company that can pay out $30 in dividends. So I have 100 in earnings. $30 is what I can afford to pay out. Why? Because I have investment needs to meet. The remaining 70 has to be invested. I decide to pay $70 in dividends. The Miller Modigliani world seems to say that shouldn't matter. So lead me through the logic of Miller Modigliani as to why this or how this works. So I pay $70 in dividends. I'm now in the hole, right? I need an extra $40. The Miller Modigliani world, why isn't that a problem? What do I do? I go, no, I don't borrow because that would alter my debt ratio. I go out and raise fresh equity. Remember, I'm in a capital market where you know, I can raise equity capital with no issuance cost. And I take the same investments I did. You're saying, aren't my existing shareholders going to be affected? Not really. Here's what's going to happen. Your existing shareholders are going to get a higher percentage of the return in dividends and less in price appreciation. There'll be dilution because I issue shares. I will get exactly the same return as a shareholder in the company. All that will change is the mix of dividends and capital gains. You're saying, why would I care about that? Remember the other half of the Miller Modigliani argument is your tax the same way in dividends and capital gains, you're neutral. In a world where capital markets are open and there are no individual tax preferences for dividends versus capital gains, it really doesn't matter what you pay in dividends. So that's the Miller Modigliani school, but you can see what's wrong with it, right? It makes some practical assumptions. Investors do care about taxes, they do care about whether they get dividends or capital gains. And capital markets are not you know, free and excess. I mean, in other words, there are issuance costs. Raising equity, new equity in particular, is much more expensive than raising new debt. In fact, the issuance costs are about four to five times higher for new equity as opposed to new debt. It's not free. So let's take the second school of thought. The dividends come with a tax disadvantage. Now, this might no longer be true. So it could very well come back with a new tax code. But until 2003, you can see the difference. The purple line is my tax rate on dividends. The green line is my tax rate on capital gains. I mean, look at the gap between those two. In fact, if you look at the 1950s, 60s, in fact, leading all the way to almost 1970, the gap is huge. Dividends are being taxed. And this is for the highest tax rate individual. So that might be something to factor in. If you're a high tax rate individual, the difference between dividends and capital gains was immense for much of the last century. In fact, when I took corporate finance, you know what the title for the dividend chapter was? The dividend puzzle. The reason being, how do you explain this? This makes no sense at all. Why would companies ever pay dividends? Because from a tax perspective, it seems like a losing, a losing proposition. So if you look at your company, one of the questions you ask is, how much do investors in my company worry about taxes on dividends and capital? I know what the tax code says, but remember, not every individual pays the same taxes. So if you're a senior citizen and you receive dividends, you might not be paying any taxes on the dividends. Why? Because your income level is low enough that there's no income tax and cuts to you. So we have no idea what the tax rate is that investors in your, maybe your investors are all pension funds, in which case, what do they pay as taxes? Zero. So to answer that question, I'm going to actually take a back-ended way of estimating what investors in your company think about dividends. And to do this, I'm going to focus on what's called the ex-dividend day. The ex-dividend day is the day by which you have to buy a stock to get the dividend. So in the old days, the way this worked was about six weeks before the actual dividend checks were mailed, because in those days, checks were mailed, 
the company would, would shut its books down. So that was the ex dividend day. So it's not actually the dividend payment day. So, and they would say, if you buy your shares by April 15, the ex dividend day, you will get the dividend. But if you buy it after, you won't. So guess what happens on April 15th? By then, you know exactly what the dividend is going to be. You know, if you get buy the stock by today, you get the dividend. But if you wait six hours, eight hours, you won't get the dividend. So the ex-dividend day, at the end of the day, the stock price drops for obvious reasons, because you now no longer get the dividend. The question is, how much will the price drop? I told you already know what the dividend is going to be. There's no uncertainty about the dividend. It's a dollar that's coming in four or five weeks. So there's really no time value issue. You'd say, well, the stock price should drop by a dollar. But it might not, and here's why. To, 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 to have the setup, let's say I start a company, I issue shares, you've all bought shares in my company. You've been shareholders for the last five years. Tomorrow is going to be the ex-dividend day. You bought the stock at a price, let's say P, you know, $10 five years ago. So you're getting to the ex-dividend day. The price before the ex-dividend day is PB. Tomorrow is the ex-dividend day. And after the ex-dividend day, you're going to have a new price. Let's leave it on, but it'll be a lower than PB, but let's call it PA. And you know what the dividend is going to be. Let's play the game of whether you should sell before the ex-dividend day or after the ex-dividend day. If you sell before the ex-dividend day, here's what you're going to get. You're going to get the price appreciation that's happened since you bought the stock, but no dividend because you sold too soon. If you wait and sell after the ex-dividend day, you're going to get the dividend on which you're going to have to pay taxes. And let's create two different tax rates because for much of the 20th century, dividends and capital gains were taxed with the rates. So this is what you would get if you sold too soon. And this is what you're going to get if you wait and collect the cash. Now for this market to be a stable market, what has to be true for most people? You're going to be indifferent, right? Because if everybody felt that selling earlier was better than selling later, you're going to do this huge wave of selling before. And if nobody thought it was, nobody's going to sell. So for most investors, those two cash flows have to be the same. Trust me, I'm going somewhere with this algebra. So basically, the cash flows from selling before and selling after have to be the same. And if I work out the algebra, I'm sorry, I've, I've written on top of it. Here's what I should expect to see. The price drop that happens in the ex-dividend day divided by the dividend should give me a sense of what you're getting taxed on in ordinary income and how much you're getting taxed on capital gains. So if I can observe what happens in the ex-dividend day, I can reverse engineer from that whether your investors are taxed more highly on dividends, are taxed the same on dividends and capital gains, or have a lower tax rate on dividends. So let's, uh, let's, ask, well, let's start with the easy one. When would you expect the price change to be roughly equal to the dividend? What has to be true about your investor tax rates and dividends and capital gains for the price change to be exactly equal to the dividend or roughly equal to the dividend? They'd have to be the same. They'd have to be the same. So if your investors are all pension funds, your price drop should be roughly the dividend. If your investors get taxed at higher rates, let's say your investors are wealthy investors, they get taxed at 50% on dividends and 20% on capital gains. What should you expect to see the price change to be on the ex dividend day? Less than the dividend or more than the dividend? It should be less than the dividend. Here's why because your dividends get taxed at a higher rate, you will accept less price appreciation to substitute for the dividend, saying, I have to pay 40% on dividends, but only 20% on capital gains. Conversely, if your investors are all senior citizens who pay no taxes on dividends and perhaps a 20% tax rate on capital gains, guess what you should expect to see? The price drop on the ex-dividend date will actually be higher than the dividend. So in the 1960s, Marty Gruber and Ned Elton, who, were in this, in the finance, who built the finance department at Stern, wrote a paper where they looked at the ex-dividend day behavior of US stocks. So it's a very simple study. They went and they, they collected thousands of companies on the ex-dividend day. They looked at the percentage drop in the stock price and they divided by the dividend to see on average across all US companies, are investors being taxed at a higher rate on dividends of capital gains? And here's what they found. They found that in their study, 
And remember in that period, the tax rate on dividends was 70% for the highest tax rate individual, 28%. The price change as a person of dividend in the 1960s was about 78 cents of price change for every dollar in dividends. So in other words, if I expect a dividend to be a dollar, your price dropped by only 78 cents. That study has been replicated multiple times. There's a study in the 80s where the tax rate difference had narrowed. It was now 50 and 20, and the price change as a person of dividends was 85%. And between 86 and 90, there was this brief period where the tax rates on both dividends and capital gains were 28%. It's like this small respite. Now, what would you expect? The tax rate is the same. The price change should be roughly the dividend, right? But even in that period, the price change is only 90. In other words, investors were still attaching a tax disadvantage to dividends, even though the tax rates were the same. And I think they were doing the right thing. Why, even if the tax rates are the same, are dividends putting you at a disadvantage relative to capital gains? The tax, and tell me why. With dividends, how? what's the tax treatment? It's your tax that year. Your tax that year. With capital gains, you get the option to determine when you collect in taxes, right? So as an individual, I was talking to my son yesterday, but he was asking about selling stocks in his portfolio. And I said, you want to sell stocks and claim a capital loss in a period where you have other capital gains, right? You, so basically, with the way you collect capital gains is you want to you want to collect them in periods where your tax rate is low, you can reduce it. There's an optionality when it comes to taxes with capital gains that you don't have in dividends. So even though the tax rate today is the same on dividends and capital gains, there is still a residual benefit from a tax perspective alone to getting capital gains because unearned income is still not taxable. The reason I keep saying still is you know that the new proposal is, at least for the very wealthy, like billion plus, that it's a horrible idea. It's a horrible idea because unearned income by definition is not earned. If I tax you on it, to pay those taxes, you either have to borrow money against your equity and you're saying, I don't care, they're billionaires, they can do that. Now, in fact, I tell people, if this rule were instituted across all your assets, I'd go bankrupt this year. You know why? Because one of my assets is a house, which has gone up 80% over the last three years. If you now tax me on the unearned income that I get on that house, how the heck am I going to pay it? I can't sell off half the house and say somebody else can stay in the third bedroom. It's a stupid idea who, which you never have seen the light of death. But because it's directed at billionaires, you know what we say? It's okay, you know, billionaires can afford it. A stupid idea remains a stupid idea no matter who it's directed at. And this stupid idea was born out of two, I would say so-called economists who used to teach at NYU and now at the White House. And the sooner they're shown the door, the better. This is as, you know, because you can't tax people on things they haven't cashed out on without creating consequences. Yes. You kind of alluded to it two slides ago. Yeah. With the paying the dip, one more slide, I guess two slides ago. Um, being indifferent between like the tax dividend they they wouldn't the day after the dividend is paid, but why is exactly because the price go down? Because isn't the next dividend they can Because if it didn't go down, it'd be a sure profit. Because what would you do? You'd buy every stock just before the ex dividend day, you'd sell it 24 hours later, you'd collect the dividends and the price didn't change. Guess what? You'd get a free lunch, right? It'd be an easy way to make money. So unless the stock price goes down, I've created this arbitrage opportunity for investors because all you need to do is go buy stocks just before the ex dividend. There's no uncertainty. Collect, you know, and then sell like six hours later after your name has been put on the, on the dividend list. Yeah. So the price has to drop on the ex dividend to prevent people from coming in and making money. And in fact, you might still have left an opening for people to make money because here's what, think about it. Let's assume that we take that 90% of the dividend, which was happening. Let's say that still happened. I th and I think it is. Let's assume that you have a stock that is going to go ex dividend tomorrow. 
And you know that on, on, on at least on an expected basis, the price drop is going to be 90% of the dividend. If you had no taxes to worry about, do you see the arbitrage that you could set up? What would you do? Correct, you, uh, that 10 drop in other words, you'd buy the stock just before the ex dividend day. You know it's going to drop by 90 cents, but you're going to collect a dollar in dividend. You're going to claim the 10 cent difference. This seems like a, easy money, right? But of course we have taxes, we can't do that. But there are investors out there who don't pay taxes. And guess what? Around X dividend days of big dividend paying companies, they do exactly this. It's called dividend capture, dividend arbitrage. And the way you can see this is if you look at the trading volume of utility stocks that pay big dividends, around X dividend days, you see that trading volume swell because there are new investors coming into the company just to hold the stock for the X dividend day and collect the dividend. For this to make money though, there are two things you need to do. First is you buy a hundred shares of Con Ed. Don't expect to make money on the X dividend day. There's just not enough money. Your transactions cost will wipe you out. If you're gonna do this, it's gotta be millions of shares. Already that restricts the number of people who can play the game. So let's assume that you have a stock that is at 50. There's a dividend that is, and it's not even expected. It's already been declared. You know, it's gonna be a dollar. Tomorrow's the X dividend day. And based on history, you think the stock price is going to drop only 90% of the dividend. So you go buy a million shares, cum dividend at $50. You wait till the stock goes X dividend. And if the studies are right, the stock price drops by 90 cents. So you've lost 90 cents, but you collect the dollar in dividends and that difference becomes your profit. It's not riskless. You know why, right? If Friday, last Friday had been an ex dividend day and you'd done this on one stock, the market is down 2% or 3% or 4%, that's going, to, that's going to overwhelm you. You got to do this across lots of stocks on ex dividend days and hope the law of large numbers works in your favor. Any questions on ex dividend days and the message they're giving you about taxes? So the dividends are bad argument is some basis. Let's look at uh, why companies then pay dividends because you're saying, given this history, why do companies not stop paying dividends in the, in the last century? There are two bad reasons that companies gave for continuing to pay dividends. And we'll get the two bad reasons out first. The first is what's called the bird in the hand fallacy. And the argument here is a stock that pays dividends will be valued higher than, a, than the same stock if it doesn't pay dividends. The reason being investors look at dividends as certain. So because it's certain, they will put a higher value to the stock. The problem with this argument is if you pay dividends, what happens to your stock price the day you pay the dividends? In, the, in, a, in other words, what cash leaves the, the company, your company then becomes riskier, the stock price drops. So this notion that investors will reward you because you pay a higher dividend that a company that pays dividends is somehow more. So you got to make it the same company and ask yourself, would I value this company more highly if it pays dividends? And remember what's left in the company then if it pays dividends will be a much riskier company, right? It's not like the company is left intact after it pays dividends. So you got to think of the same company with cash or pays out dividends. And very quickly, you can see this argument goes nowhere. So if somebody says, we're paying dividends because we get a higher P ratio or a higher price because we pay dividends, push them on it because that doesn't make any sense because that cash leaving the company makes the rest of your company riskier. Here's the second argument. We had a really good year last year. So let's pay dividends. You see the problem with this argument? Is you go out and pay dividends, especially if you have big investment needs in the future, you pay the dividends out because you had a good year. Next year, what do you have to do? You have to go out and raise fresh equity and the year after and the year after. If you have long-term investment needs, just because this year you had cash left over doesn't mean you should pay this dividends. You're probably better off keeping the cash and covering future investment needs. Why? Because raising new shares, new equity is expensive. This is actually a study that looks at the issuance costs, especially at small companies for equity versus debt. So the blue is the cost of issuing debt, the, or the purple is the cost of issuing new equity. Across the board, equity is more expensive than debt. And if you're a smaller company, that cost rises even more. So let me reinforce the argument. 
If you're a very large company, maybe if you have a good year, you should just pay it as dividends and then say, I can raise fresh equity. But if you're a smaller company, you got to be much more careful because raising fresh equity is expensive. So the two bad reasons for paying dividends is somehow you get a higher stock price because you pay dividends. Get rid of that notion. The second is you had a good year. You're just going to pay out as dividends. Remember, you have other years coming down the pike where you might need that cash. So I'm going to list out three potentially good reasons, and I'm going to put quotes around the good because it's going to be very company specific for why companies might choose to pay dividends. The first is what's called a clientele story. I mean, I'm going to put out a, say, you know, a statement that I use with dividend. You get the stockholders you deserve. If you pay high dividends, guess who buys your shares? People who like high dividends. If you pay no dividends, who, guess who buys your share? People who don't like dividends, they want price appreciation. And over time, you accumulate an investor base that likes what you do. We'll talk about how this can create a problem because you accumulate an investor base that likes dividends and you can afford to pay the dividends, you're fine, right? You're utility. But remember, at one point in time, phone companies used to be utilities. All the bells that used to, you know, Verizon used to be an old one, I don't know which bell it was, you know? Nice, mature company. But Verizon today is, a, is more a technology company than a telecom company. So you talk about how to deal with that disconnect. So that's the clientele story. If you get investors who like dividends, then you're in a sense trapped into this policy where your investors want you to pay more dividends. They want you to actually increase dividends. The second is a signaling story. You've kind of averted to this already, but you were talking about a negative signal that's set by paying dividends. But there's a different story you can tell. What do we say about dividends? That they're sticky, right? So when a company increases dividends, you know what it's also signaling? That it feels secure enough about future earnings that it went out and raised dividends. So there's a positive signaling story I can tell about dividends as well. It's only companies that feel secure about future prospects increase. So we're going to see what the market thinks. Is it thinks it's more of a negative or a positive signal? And you're going to see some mixed results here. And finally, there is a third and not a very noble argument for paying dividends, which is it's a way of ripping off your bondholders. And here's why. If you're a lender to a company and it has cash, what would you most like the company to do with that cash? No, you don't want it to pay it back. You're a lender. You want the company to hold on to that cash because once they pay it back or pay it out, the cash leaves the company, right? They, you don't want them to pay dividends. In fact, if lenders said dividend policy, guess what they'd said it at? Zero dividends, zero buybacks. Let's keep the cash in the company. It makes us feel much better. So when you pay dividends, you're essentially going against the wishes of lenders. Lenders know this. So you know what they do? They put in covenants on dividend policy. Dividends can't take it. But if, and they price the bonds based on expected dividends. Right? They say you pay out 30% of your earnings as dividends. But let's say you surprise them and decide to pay out 80% of your earnings as dividends. You know what's going to happen the day you surprise them? Bond prices are going to drop because lenders are going to effectively wake up and say, we've overpriced these bonds. These guys are riskier than we thought they were. So let's start with the clientele story. And I'm going to give you the results of a research paper that I think was surprising to the people doing the paper. I'll tell you why I say that. Most cases when somebody sits down to write an academic research paper, they already know what they're going to find. It's a kabuki dance. You act like you're an objective scientist, but the results are completely predictable because you know where you're going to end up. So this was a study in the early 70s of a stock called Citizens Utility. I think it's still around. It's a, a Northern New York utility. It's a smaller utility. But what made Citizens Utility were unique was that it had two classes of shares. The classes were not based on voting rights, they were based on dividends. On class A shares, you received a cash dividend. On class B shares, you got a stock dividend. Normally stock dividends are useless, but class B shares could be converted to class A shares at your option. So what I, bit, what I was effectively offering on these two shares was on class A shares, you got a cash dividend. On class B shares, you got an equivalent amount of price appreciation. Remember, this was the 1970s. 
And if you remember, dividends were taxed at a much higher rate than capital gains. So I'm giving you two classes of shares. And what you, one, you get dividends. The other, you get capital gains. In a rational world, you know what the researchers expected to find, right? They expected class B shares to trade at a premium on class A shares because you were getting the same return in capital gains instead of dividends. And the results completely threw them off. They found that at least at citizen utility, class A shares traded a premium on class B shares. In fact, this study was replicated on Canadian utilities, which have the same phenomenon of you know, dividend capital gain. In almost every single one of these companies, the cash dividend shares you know, were trading at a premium on capital gains. Yeah. Wouldn't that create an arbitrage opportunity in which you could buy class B you shares? Could. You could make it disappear, but obviously it was not large enough for people to be interested in doing. So for whatever reason, it persisted. So my question is, why? Why would come investors be willing to pay more for dividends than capital gains? Well, for companies like that, I've heard the analysis that it's mostly held by like retirees or people who are working for the company. In fact, that's exactly right. If you look at these companies, they were held by older people, retired people, pension funds which wanted the dividends. And guess what? They like dividends. They didn't care what the theory told them, what the tax code told them. They said, we don't care. We want that check in the mail every three months because I base my rent payments on that dividend check. At least, so I wouldn't generalize from, I'm not saying all investors like cash dividends, but the investors in these companies like cash dividends. And in fact, there have been studies since that show that if you look at companies, companies draw investors to them that reflect their dividend policies. If you pay high dividends, you tend to attract older investors, poorer investors. If you pay no dividends, you attract wealthier investors, people who don't want dividends. And you develop a dividend clientele over time that reflects your dividend policy. So I'm going to end with that statement that over time, you're going to see investors buy your stocks based on the dividends you pay. But next session, after the quiz, I'm going to start with the question, what if you get a mismatch? Your investors historically have seen you pay dividends, but now you've made this transition into a growth company. You need to reinvest money. You can't afford to pay dividends. How do you get out of this trap you've dug for yourself because of your own history? So we'll do that after the quiz on Wednesday. So I'll see you on Wednesday.